Robert S. Mueller, former FBI director, and most recently, the special counsel who investigated Russian interference in the 2016 election, and Donald Trump's obstruction of that investigation will testify before Congress. To say the eyes of the world will be watching would be an understatement. The president's degree of angst and alarm will be easily tracked on his Twitter feed and Rudy Giuliani's media appearances. Any gains made by Democrats in communicating the devastating details unearthed by Robert Mueller's 448-page report will be discerned only by what happens after Mueller's testimony. Does Congress call additional witnesses to appear? Do they strengthen their power of subpoena? Do they press the case made by Mueller himself that if the special counsel had found that Donald Trump had not committed crimes, he would have said so. Some of those questions will be answered tomorrow and in the days that follow, but today, today we can answer questions about how we got here. How did the FBI come to open an investigation into the Trump campaign and its suspicious contacts with Russians? How did the FBI view the firing of its director after that director failed to abide by the president's request that he see to it to let Mike Flynn, the president's national security advisor, who admitted to lying to the FBI about his conversations with the Russian ambassador, go? Why did so many people around Donald Trump tell so many lies about the very same thing? Their contacts and communications with Russians. And how can members of Congress best utilize their time with the man who knows the answers to all those questions when he comes before them tomorrow? There is no one better suited for that mission than former FBI director, former deputy attorney general, author of the book A Higher Loyalty, Jim Comey. Also with us here at the table for the hour, former senior FBI official Chuck Rosenberg, former Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill, former Republican congressman from Florida, now an independent, David Jolly, and Barrett Berger, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York, an embarrassment of riches in terms of expertise. We're going to start with you, Mr. Director. How did we get here? We got here in terms of the FBI's investigation because we learned in late July of 16 from an allied ambassador who had had a conversation with a Trump foreign policy advisor about that advisor's conversations about the fact that the Russians had dirt and were looking for ways to share it, to coordinate their use of it with the Trump campaign. That's what started our investigation in late July. So it's so cut and dry, it's so straightforward the way you put it, but what you just said is the subject of three investigations that we know of. The origins of that FBI investigation are now being investigated. Uh, Attorney General Barr has uh, ordered, I think, the third investigation being run out of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Connecticut. Uh, John Huber has been investigating the origins of the investigation, which you just detailed in, I think, less than about 17 seconds uh, for years. Um, the, the inspector general is expected to come out with his findings. Why is it under so much scrutiny by so many people? I don't know. I don't know exactly what all of those people are looking at, but I can tell you the reason we started it is plain and transparent. It's laid out in the special counsel's report, and frankly, we all should have been fired if we didn't investigate that kind of lead to figure out is there an American connection to this massive Russian effort? I don't know what people are looking at beyond that. I suppose we'll find out at some point. I want to just put a button on this part of the conversation because I expect it's um, a lot of what we'll hear from Republicans tomorrow and their questioning of uh, Robert Mueller. And I want to read something that you wrote in the Washington Post. Go ahead. Investigate the investigators if you must. When those investigations are over, you will find the work was done appropriately and focused only on discerning the truth of very serious allegations. There was no corruption. There was no treason. There was no attempted coup. Those are lies and dumb lies at that. There were just good people trying to figure out what was true under unprecedented circumstances. Does Robert Mueller have an obligation to defend the men and women of the FBI tomorrow? I don't think that he does. I think he has an obligation to represent his work, and the work by its nature and its quality and its depth will represent the FBI in a pretty good way. I heard from a source today familiar with Attorney General Barr's thinking that he's nervous about being attacked tomorrow. What sort of exposure does Attorney General Barr have? Well, I don't think he'll be attacked by the witness or witnesses. I think he may be attacked by Democrats fairly, in my view, for 
misrepresenting what was in Director Mueller's report and how he handled the entire thing and the way he has slimed the FBI since. But frankly, I hope there's not a lot of that because this is a chance for the American people to learn more about what the special counsel found. And the fewer attacks and the more questions, the better served the American people will be. Do you think, though, that there is a trail of evidence, at least in the letters that have become public from Robert Mueller to Attorney General Barr, that justify um, at least a couple lines of questioning about what Robert Mueller was so concerned about that drove him to write his former colleague and longtime friend, William Barr, two letters? I'm sure there's good reason for people to ask. If I were advising them, and I'm not, I would urge them not to waste any of their five minutes on that because Bob Mueller is a person of his word, and he said he wasn't going to go beyond his report, so I'd be shocked if he would answer process questions, as troubling as the process might have been that he'll answer them instead of just sticking to his report. And if you were advising them, I mean, you are... Um I think known to be a very effective storyteller. How would you elicit from Robert Mueller the story of his investigation? I would either ask him direct leading questions to have him affirm key parts of the report, or I would ask him to read lines from the report, or both. I mean, this is a chance for the American people to learn what he found. It's too bad that having published a 450-page report that didn't get the job done, but it didn't. Folks don't know what he found, and you can ask him in a simple, straightforward way and get those details in front of the American people. What are the most important details in that first volume about the Trump orbit, the Trump campaign's contacts with Russians, the very same sorts of um, intersections between suspicious Russians and Trump campaign advisors or former campaign advisors that made you feel like you had to open an investigation into them? Well, the first volume focuses on that Russian interference. And to my mind, the most important finding of the special counsel is that there was a long series of contacts between people associated with the Trump campaign and Russians. And the two of those contacts are particularly troubling. One, his foreign policy advisor talking to someone who was representing the Russians about the prospect of them weaponizing dirt they had on Hillary Clinton in the form of emails. And second, that the senior campaign team took a meeting at Trump Tower in June of 2016 that they were told in writing was part of Russia and its government's efforts to help Mr. Trump. Those are two things that I think will surprise a lot of people who have just listened to the attorney general and the president and who haven't read the report. And I think a lot of the public is, um, if, if you're a hardened Trump supporter, you may be comforted by the fact that no criminal conspiracy was charged. If you're on the other side, you may be troubled by it. But if you're somewhere in the middle, you may simply be confused by it. What did the report find when it came to the question of collusion, contact, coordination with Russians? First, the special counsel said this investigation is not about collusion. That's not a thing except in political rhetoric. He examined the evidence to see if there was sufficient evidence to charge any Americans with being part of the Russian attack on our election in 2016. And to my mind, it's good news. He concluded there wasn't sufficient evidence to charge somebody with a crime. OK, this is not a criminal proceeding tomorrow. This is about showing the American people the facts that were found. And the facts that were found, whether or not they're criminal charges, are deeply troubling. There were a lot of contacts between the Russians who were bent on interfering and the Trump campaign that was keen to benefit from that interference. That's important. Those, those facts are important for people to know. You're important to this story, too. And I can tell from your live shot that you are nowhere near where this hearing is going to take place tomorrow. It looks like you're in beautiful St. Louis. Claire McCaskill's here, and she's glad to see that. Glad it's a great it. state. Great state. <laughs> Thank you. Did, did you think when you opened that investigation that once that investigation that obviously started, with, you started it, Robert Mueller uh, ended it, did you think you'd be watching as a former FBI director from St. Louis or wherever you're going to be tomorrow? I didn't. I did not. How I ended up in this place in my life is a mystery to me a little bit. I never would have expected it. But I didn't know what the facts were. We opened an investigation, as we do all investigations, to see what the facts were. And I didn't know whether it would show that there was a chargeable case involving Americans or not. I wanted to find out what was true. 
That's the FBI's job. And as I said at the beginning, I, I don't know who in their right mind would think the FBI should not have opened this investigation. I asked the staff at the FBI, do it well, do it discreetly, because we don't want to smear innocent people, especially in the middle of a, pol of a political election year. But we don't want to let bad guys know we're on to them if there's something to this. That's work we had to do. I wouldn't have imagined it would end up with me sitting in a chair in awesome St. Louis talking to you, <laughs> but I'm proud of the fact that we opened that investigation. I'm proud of the way that we did it, and I'm proud of the way that Director Mueller and his team continued it. In, in some of the political analysis, and I appreciate the distinction between what politicos and pundits do to what are, are in some instances, very technical legal questions, and, and, and please jump in and correct me if, if I get anything wrong in that vein, but a lot of people think you put some of this in motion by coming out after Hillary Clinton's investigation of her use of a personal email account, investigating whether or not she transmitted any classified information, and being so public and explaining her conduct. Donald Trump certainly felt at the time like that was a boost to him. You've testified that you feel physically ill at the thought that you had any hand in the election. Do you ever open up the newspaper or turn on the television and, and feel any sense of responsibility for putting any of this in motion? I don't feel responsibility in the sense that I think we should have done something differently. I'm, I'm proud of the way we conducted ourselves, both with respect to the Clinton investigation and this Russian interference investigation. I wish we hadn't been involved at all, frankly. If I had a magic wand, I would remove us from the picture. But given where we were, we made decisions that I think were thoughtful, responsible decisions, even if people disagree about them. We also made a decision not to say anything about the investigation of Russian interference and whether Americans were connected to it. I still think that was the right decision. It was so early, we didn't know whether there was any truth to it. It would have been irresponsible to talk about it. All that said, yeah, it still makes me slightly sick to my stomach to think that we at the FBI had any role in the political process in 2016. I hate that idea. We never want to be involved, but we were stuck in the middle and tried always to make the least bad decision among bad options. And I'm sure you saw some of the reporting after the Mueller report came out, and some parallels drawn to your handling of the Clinton investigation, and the criticisms for Mueller and Barr frankly came down on all sides, that you were forced to make a decision, you did that, you were criticized. Mueller didn't make a decision on obstruction, he left that to Barr. He's criticized by Barr for not making a decision. Do you feel like the FBI is in a moment where they can't win no matter which way they try to slice these very difficult questions? Definitely. I mean, the FBI found itself over the last couple of years like a ref on a World Cup soccer pitch. You got to make calls and people are going to hate you for the calls you make. But I'm proud of the way the decisions that I was part of were made. There's no way to get out of it without being criticized. But transparency as much as is possible under the law is always the best best path and among i know i've criticized bill barr a lot i was very happy that he offered transparency in the form of a report to the american people now very few people read the report so tomorrow's a chance for more transparency which is always good for a democracy i want to drill down a little bit on that question and, and on the disposition of the obstruction of justice investigation so the, the way it landed and and again and please come in after me and clean this up if I mess it up. I've got Chuck Rosenberg here as my, my tutor, but I still get this He'll wrong. clean up me. Right. <laughs> He'll clean us both up. <laughs> so um, what Mueller found, what he said in his nine-minute press statement most recently, was that if he could have asserted that, that they'd found that the president hadn't committed any crimes, they would have said so. He did not. And then in the obstruction volume, they examine, I think, 10 incidents. One of them is your firing, and, and they ascertain whether or not the president obstructed justice. Do you understand why the public is so confused by this statement that he did not not commit crimes, but he didn't get charged with any crimes? I do. Bob Mueller was trying to do something principled and fair, I think. And I, I know that when you try and do that, sometimes it confuses people a lot. Make some he people was, mad. <laughs> it does yeah, more it than does, confuse it, us. It does, but here's how I understand what he tried to do. He reasoned that as a prosecutor working at the Department of Justice, he can't bring charges against a sitting president. And if he can't charge a sitting president, it would be unfair in writing to accuse the president of a crime because there couldn't be any adjudication and opportunity for vindication by that president. So what he would do is try to be fair to the president and principled and simply lay out the evidence he had gathered 
gathered so that a future prosecutor, when the man is no longer sitting president, could take a look at it. That confused a whole lot of people because then the attorney general grabbed it and said there's no there there and ended the case. I think what Director Mueller has done, which will be shown tomorrow, is laid out a damning series of facts that allow people to evaluate how this president acted, regardless of whether you think the attorney general made the right decision on whether there ought to be charges or not. Tomorrow is not a criminal proceeding. It's about showing the American people here are the facts. Okay, I want to go through some of that, but you gave me two things to unpack, so I just want to follow up on, on two things sure. you just said. Um, that the, the, This idea that Robert Mueller knew at the beginning he couldn't charge the president is the same defense that sources close to Barr offer for why he should have simply issued a declination letter. Why didn't he do that, in your opinion? Is it so that there could be a future prosecution? I think he didn't issue a declination letter because the evidence didn't support a declination letter. The evidence teed up difficult questions of fact and law and raised significant reasons to believe the president was guilty of obstruction of justice. And he felt like he shouldn't engage in the process of sorting that out because he might well conclude the guy's guilty. And in Director Mueller's view, that would be unfair given the principles he was operating under. And so he laid, he laid the case out, I think, for a future prosecutor and I think for Congress and the American people to understand, here's how this president has acted. A former colleague of mine from, from the Bush White House said, they're lucky Robert Mueller wasn't forced to render a decision because it looks to this individual like he would have said, fine, I recommend prosecution. Is it your sense that that might be true? And then if I could just add, give you a two-parter here, do you agree with the 800-plus prosecutors who have said that if Donald Trump were anyone other than the president of the United States, he would absolutely have been charged with obstruction? So I'll take the second question first. Yes, I agree. If this were a case about someone who, other than the president, they'd already have been indicted on at least several of these obstruction incidents, maybe all of them, I don't know. But Director Mueller, I think, if pressed, would reach a decision, at least on some of them, that there is sufficient basis to charge the president. But again, he's a principled person trying to be fair and said, I shouldn't be doing that given that the man can't vindicate himself. I, I'd be shocked if he imagined that Bill Barr would take the thing and say, oh, thanks, Bob. No case here. We're closing it. I'd be shocked. But I, I doubt if he's pressed tomorrow, he's going to give any answers along the lines of what we're talking about. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.